Um, welcome back for our afternoon sessions. Uh, we have two more of these crossfire panels. This one is on the appropriate venue for trying terrorist cases. Your moderator today is Professor Lou Katz, who is an eminent criminal law professor. He also started our LLM program about 15 years ago, um, which brings 50 foreign lawyers, including Judge Rod, who you've seen today, um, the judge from the Iraqi High Tribunal, to our law school to study every year. And Lou, thank you very much for moderating, and I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for bringing all of these panels together. I think sitting up there, I didn't realize that our first task is to make sure we don't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Let me briefly introduce this distinguished panel. You all have fuller biographies in front of you. On your left is Jim Benjamin, a partner in the New York office of Aiken and Gump, um, where he represents individuals involved in high-profile, large-scale securities, uh, white-collar criminal cases, and also SEC in investigations. He was law clerk to Justices Powell and Stevens. Wow. And um, he co-authored a report for Human Rights First entitled In Pursuit of Justice, Prosecuting Terrorism, cases in the federal courts. Um, next to Jim is Justin Herdman, an adjunct member of our faculty, um, but who in real life is an assistant U.S. attorney here in Cleveland, assigned to the National Security Unit, responsible for investigating and prosecuting international and domestic terrorism um, and espionage. Justin was a member of the team that prosecuted the Toledo terrorism cases. Uh, next to Justin, it's my pleasure to welcome back our graduate and former colleague, Amos Giora, who's currently on the faculty at the law school at the University of Utah. Before Amos started his distinguished teaching and writing career, he was the Judge Advocate General of the Israeli Navy. Um, Amos has written four books on national security and terrorism issues. His most recent book, which will be published in October, is called Freedom from Religion. Next to Amos is Scott Silliman, a law professor at Duke and the director of the law school center on law, ethics, and national security. He spent 25 years as a judge advocate at major Air Force camp uh, commands, and he um, was in charge of the deployment of all Air Force JAGs um, during uh, Operation Desert Storm? Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Desert Shield. Um, he teaches national security law, at the university, at three universities in North Carolina. He's also a member of the Commission on Military Justice. To my right is Captain Glenn Sulmacy. Is He's a judge advocate and has been on the faculty of the Coast Guard Academy since 2001. He publishes and lectures on the law of armed conflict and national security matters. He was a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and is the author of The National Security Court System on the Issue of Justice in the Age of Terror. I think we can have some uh, spirited <coughs> discussion and disagreement here this afternoon. Um, our topic, as referred to by the last panel, is the prosecution bin. Um, what does that mean? What are our alternatives, what are our choices. Um, for those detainees who will be prosecuted. By the way, let me just say, I can't avoid making this comment. Um, when we got to the discussion of preventive detention of American citizens during the last panel, 
Whoever said that knocked me the hell off my chair. <laughs> and I left the room for a few minutes. Um, but what are our options, Jim? Why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I, I think it's important to start by emphasizing the way that question was framed and hearkening back to General Altenberg's remarks this morning. The questions of detention and prosecution really are two different things. Um, they overlap in various ways. They may relate to each other, but they really ultimately are two different things. On the question of prosecution, where, we sh where should we prosecute people whom we decide to prosecute? Um, the, uh, there, there, are, there are two options that are sort of presently um, uh, under discussion um, and were referred to by President Obama in his uh, speech at the National Archives. Um, one is the Article III court system, uh, and the two is in a sort of revamped, revised form of military commissions. Um, my own view, um, as a, a criminal defense lawyer and former um, federal prosecutor, um, is, and this is informed by uh, a body of research that Professor Katz referred to um, that I conducted along with many of my colleagues at Aiken Gump. My own view is that the Article III court system um, is, um, in many cases, and perhaps in all, in all cases, um, the appropriate place to prosecute people who have been uh, charged with terrorism-related offenses. Why? Well, I think most importantly because it works. Um, and there's actually one of the, to me, the central ironies of the, um, all the, the whole series of fiascos and problems that were discussed earlier this morning with the original um, effort to establish military commissions. One of the central ironies was that the entire you know, impetus for using military commissions in the first place was the view that the court system was deficient and that you couldn't prosecute these cases after all in federal court. So you need to start with you know, uh, a new system of military commissions. And you know, uh, how, I, how ironic is it that we are now you know, uh, almost eight years down the road since that original executive order establishing military commissions and the military commissions um, have um, adjudicated a grand total of three cases uh, which were described uh, this morning while, in contrast, the federal courts have continued um, year over year, um, day after day, in courtrooms in Cleveland and New York and Washington and Alexandria and all over this country to fairly um, and uh, credibly adjudicate uh, all manner of terrorism cases, large and small, um, uh, without a single documented instance of a serious security breach. Um, with results that are uniformly accepted as credible and reliable, with sentences that are serious, with evidence that is uh, reliable. Um, and uh, I personally think that that is a record that uh, we as lawyers um, and as Americans should be proud of, and further, uh, that it's worked. So my, my view is, um, we can talk more about it as we get into it, but um, there's, a, there's quite a lot of data that uh, demonstrates the effectiveness of the court system. Okay, I think it would be good to hear from everyone. Scott, you wanted to? Yeah. First of all, I, I don't want to disagree with anything that Jim has said. He's right. Those that suggest that the Article III court system are inadequate, I think carry the argument way too far. And I do commend his superb research in the human rights uh, first uh, uh, articles, both the, the original and the update. But I think even Jim's research indicates that in significant cases, like the Musawi case in the Fourth Circuit, Eastern District of Virginia, it puts a real burden uh, on Judge Brinkema, who had to deal with that case, particularly if you've got a defendant that wants to go pro se. Uh, there, there are significant Brady issues in discovery. So, no one is saying that the Article III court system will not work. It's the fact that it will be strained if you put a large number of cases, particularly in one district, I would suggest, Jim. So I would say, no matter how uh, disparaging the comments about military commissions this morning, I think there needs to be an option, not for all the cases, but I think that 
the terrorism cases coming out of Guantanamo Bay, of which I think there will only be 30 or 35 at most, uh, there needs to be two different forums available depending upon the case. And particularly, if you want to have a case that is prosecuted outside the United States and the individual, if convicted, detained or incarcerated outside the United States, you could do that with a military commission, but you couldn't do it with an Article III court. So I think we need a combination. Justin, you've had experience with this? Yes. Well, at the outset, I just need to say that nothing I'm about to say here is, is official Department of Justice policy. It's, I'm here in my own personal capacity. I just need to say that at the outset. But, um, that applies to you as well, right? <laughs> I, speak um, for I speak for Duke. <laughs> <laughs> Even the basketball, the basketball team? <laughs> That's right. I dribble. You right. <laughs> dribble. Um, I, my answer to this question, which is obviously the... the in some ways the entire point of, of why we're all here today, is that uh, I don't know the answer. Um, it's, in some ways, it's too early to tell. Um, I, I can speak to the possibilities of trying terrorism cases in an Article III court. Uh, I can't speak to the mechanics of that. Uh, but what I can't speak to are the specific deficiencies and what have ever been perceived as deficiencies in those cases that may or may not end up in a military commission. Um, there could be evidentiary deficiencies. Um, there could be classified discovery issues. Um, the, the bottom line is we don't know what is really going on in a lot of those cases. Um, to the extent that those cases can be prosecuted in Article III courts, um, I think that they, they will be. I think that that's the indication that, uh, that the administration has given. But um, uh, what, what I can say is that, I, I think I come down with Jim on, on this point, is that an Article III court has tremendous flexibility in the way that it can handle a lot of the issues that come up, even the ones that I've just discussed, the evidentiary issues. We're going to get next okay. to those, how it would differ from an ordinary criminal trial. And I won't get into the mechanics right now, but all, all I can say is that it's, it's possible. All right, Amos, where do you stand? Well, as, when Jim and I testified last summer in front of the U.S. Uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, we very much agreed to disagree, and we're going to continue that same, continue to disagree. Because I would argue that Article III courts are going to be, which adjective, inappropriate, inapplicable, not practical in terms of meeting the standards of bringing to trial not the, the hundreds of people we're talking about in Guantanamo or the tens of people we're talking about in Guantanamo, but all the detainees who are presently being held on or on behalf of the United States worldwide. I think it's important that we not only affix ourselves to the issue of Guantanamo as Guantanamo, but think about the larger picture, which I would say that we are holding thousands of people on our behalf, thousands of people are being held worldwide in Iraq, Afghanistan, and God knows where else. So I suggest that in terms of the relevant paradigm, the, param the paradigm is not Guantanamo. The paradigm is what I call post-9-11 detainees and how we provide those thousands of individuals a proper trial as we know it to be. Yeah, and if we draw distinctions between those at Guantanamo or in the United States and those being held in Afghanistan or elsewhere, as was pointed out this morning, we then create an incentive to keep people outside of the United States. Well, so we've got to address that, too. Absolutely, we have to address that. And I think that the study that you referred to, Lou, that, that Jim did, is an incredibly thorough and important um, research study that you did. That said, right, that said, <laughs> It looks at it from a very limited perspective, looking at specific individual trials rather than the much larger picture. I think there really is, in many ways, we talked about this last summer, there is a discrepancy if we're talking about this slice or this slice. And if you talk about only this slice, then perhaps your proposal makes sense. But if we really understand how many, people, how many individuals potentially will be brought to, to trial, then the Article III courts, I think, speaking very frankly, no offense intended to anybody, just aren't going to work which is why I have suggested in a number of writings, as Lou mentioned, I've suggested creating an alternative, not military commissions, but an alternative which would be bringing terrorist, individuals suspected of involvement in terrorism to an alternative legal process, which would combine our criminal process as we know it, and in addition to that, a couple of additions in order to begin the process. And we must remember, in your comment earlier, we're holding thousands of people indefinitely, and the time has come to address that directly, the time has come to address that candidly, and the only way to do that by going forward with an alternative judicial paradigm. All right, Glenn? 
I, I think uh, what's interesting is eight years later, we're still trapped in the two paradigms, rigidly trapped in the law enforcement model, the traditional federal courts, or the law of war and military commissions. And we're kind of trapped in both of those still. And what I view kind of along the lines of what Amos is saying is, is that what we need to look to is, is to morph, expand, and, and adapt as we have strategically and tactically in other areas to look at uh, we're fighting a hybrid war, a mixture of law enforcement military operations, which is unprecedented in American warfare. A hybrid warrior, a mixture of an international criminal and a warrior, is sort of unique Al-Qaeda fighter. So if you have a hybrid warrior fighting in a hybrid war, it seems a logical extension. We would at least consider and embrace a hybrid court system, a national court, uh, security court system, which is what I do think is the right way to go for all uh, of the details. You should elaborate on what that would entail. Um, the uh, basics of uh, a national security court system would be Article Three life tenure judges. It would be, instead of run by the Department of Defense, would be run civilian oversight by the Department of Justice, uh, specifically the National Security Division, uh, brought on board military bases. And, and one of the items when you hear national security court and some of my uh, colleagues, Ben Wittes and Jack and Neil and some other folks, and sometimes Amos as well, that espouse the national security court seek to use it for preventative detention. And one of the items that Jim was speaking of earlier was the president in the National Archives in a very eloquent speech mentioned different options. What he didn't, what he left the door open for was approximately 75 to 100 detainees that they don't know what to do with. Some will go in civilian courts, some will go in military commissions arguably, and he left the door open. And that door opening is really for what I think bothered you earlier, Professor, was preventative detention or administrative detention. And different from other national security court pro proposals, I embrace the idea of it being adjudicatory, a presumptively adjudicatory system. If we create a system like this, the goal should be to try all of them in a presumptive status. If there's a case in, in some circumstances where uh, the person is so dangerous, where the military, Department of Defense, and the administration feel so strongly that they can't uh, try this person, then that should be an exception rather than the norm and codifying Preventive detention, I think, would be dangerous. So in this national security court system that my book right has, and as well as I've spoken about, is presumptively adjudicatory, which I think is critical. Is that consistent with your views, Amos? Well, I think that to make an, uh, an alternative judicial paradigm viable, what well, there has to be is the kind of judicial review that, speaking very frankly, again, not disrespectfully, that we have not seen over the course of the past eight years in the United States. I think to have, if you're going to create an alternative judicial paradigm, it means that the United States Supreme Court has to be much more actively engaged than it has been to date. I think if we track the course of the past eight years, the Supreme Court has, has been, play word would be reticent. And I think to, if you're going to create an alternative, which I do really believe is essential, hand in hand with that, the Supreme Court has to be much more engaged. I really do not, I think that placing this or leaving this in the hands of the military, with all due respect to, um, our previous speakers, I think it's wrong to leave it in the hands of the military. It needs to be a civilian alternative process. Uh, I think the Supreme Court's already spoken, in a way, in the Hamdan case. And, and in that case, the court held up the traditional court martial system that has been in operation in this country for over 50 years as being the gold standard that met the fourth prong of Common Article Three. And as this Congress now moves forward on the Senate bill, and, and we should know within three or four weeks what's going to come out of conference, and my guess is, Lou, that the House, which has nothing on military commissions in the Authorization Act, will accede to the Senate. So we're, we're going to have a bill. And my study of this bill indicates that it comes very close to the rules of procedure and modes of proof currently used in courts martial, which is a high standard. If, in fact, we say this is not sufficient, nor the Article III Court is not sufficient, and we engage in creating a new type of system, e either, uh, either one that's being proposed, I, I think we're sending to the international community, at the very least, a message saying we're just going to try again with a new type of system that looks more like trying to fashion a court that will gain convictions <coughs> and not have fundamental fairness. Uh, and I'm not sure the Congress is politically eager to do that. And the president, if I understand his comments, is really leaving open the two principal, as, as Jim said in his opening comments, the two principal forms of military commissions and Article Three courts is those that he intends to pursue 
but again, uh, I, I think the military commissions are going to have to have a good PR job uh, after the, the new bill is passed. Can I just jump in for a second? My response to that, Scott, would be that, again, it's going to depend on how many, what, what are the numbers we're talking about. And the numbers issue is absolutely essential to this, to this discussion. Are we talking about 55 people in Guantanamo, or are we talking about thousands? And if we're talking about hundreds and or thousands, then I'm just not convinced that the Article III court system, as it's presently constituted, is going to provide the kind of justice that we require. But you could do that in military commissions, because you could have military commissions anywhere in the world, including Bagram. Uh, courts martials are dealt with in the thousands. And my, oh, absolutely. And my response to that, if I can, Lou, just for a second, I think that the process needs to be, it's not English, to be civilianized and not to be militarized. Well, oh, not Len, English. Sorry. Len wanted, <laughs> I appreciate it. I do think Amos Talk is right about the civilian. Did you hear that? He said Amos is right. It's, uh, he told me to say Amos is right every five seconds. So, so I'd start now and agree with him. Um, but I do think one item with the National Security Court as well is you, you do have um, a system that we're looking at or is being considered uh, still should be sunset. One of the items we want to try to do is provide some prevention of potential abuse of such a system. And certainly that's a legitimate concern of many legal scholars and, and policymakers. And a five-year sunset provision would be beneficial towards possibly Amos's comments about the numbers. If the numbers aren't, if there's no longer a need for it, then it dissolves and goes away with a new, arguably potentially a new president, a new Congress, or whomever when the situation changes. Uh, Justin, you've had some experience with in Article Three courts yes. with terrorism prosecutions. Now, this isn't quite the same. These aren't people who were arrested or captured on a battle front. Um, how does it differ from an ordinary criminal case? Uh, well, uh, in a lot of ways, it's not fundamentally different. Um, it proceeds much the same as any other criminal case um, in terms of the, uh, the, the steps that are taken, the rules that apply. Um, obviously, the, the big differences are sometimes um, the, the nature of the crime itself, that is the charging decision that goes into uh, do you charge someone with a, a terrorism offense um, under Title 18, the criminal code, or do you uh, elect to charge something that is not a terrorism crime um, in order to achieve some other objective, typically what's called disruption? Um, that, that's at the outset. So that's, and, and that actually brings me back to a question that I'll have, I'll save it for later, but about the National Security Court and, and how we're going to divide up those individuals that would go into a National Security Court. But, um, uh, the way that the court handles the evidence and the way that the rules that are applied are generally the same. Um, the exceptions would be if there's classified evidence that's um, uh, either being introduced by the government uh, or there's classified information that exists that um, the court needs to consider whether or not to allow discovery of some of that information. And the second exception would be whether there's any information that comes out of uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That would also trigger um, some, some procedures that are different than the run-of-the-mill uh, criminal prosecution. Um, but in general, the way that the, the witnesses are called, um, the way that most of the evidence is handled is the same, with the exception of those two very large caveats. Those are big. Yes, they are. Um, how do you satisfy the Sixth Amendment right to confrontation? Uh, well, it depends. Again, like with most of these issues, it depends what the actual evidence is. Um, but the Classified Information Procedures Act, which is um, the, the statute that exists for a court to consider classified evidence, um, is quite flexible in the way that the court is given options to handle this evidence. So um, the court can consider the classified evidence and grant defense counsel clearances to also review the information. The court can also hold an in-camera in hearing where uh, court hears from both sides with respect to certain evidence, if the court deems that that's necessary. Um, and, and I just want to point out, with the classified evidence, the governing standard here is, uh, it actually harkens back to a Supreme Court case that was based on a mob informant. So courts have been relatively flexible in terms of applying analogous case law to this realm of classified evidence. And uh, where the government's governing standard is whether that, that information is both relevant and helpful, that would trigger discovery. Um, and also the court is, is <coughs> enabled to provide alternative discovery. So that is they can provide substitutes for classified information that would not reveal the sources and methods of wherever that intelligence came from um, and is given quite a bit of flexibility in terms of fashioning 
uh, a remedy to what you pointed out as a, a Sixth Amendment problem. How do you have an in-camera adversarial hearing if the defense doesn't have full access to uh, the material? The, the, well, the defense meaning the defense attorney and the defendant. Um, and in, in most cases, the defendant is not allowed to be present in, in an in-camera hearing. Um, and uh, that is uh, a very significant hurdle in, in many cases. Um, the, the governing standards, though, my, my impression is um, that the governing standards allow for defense counsel um, to both assess what that information is and still make a, a quite color, uh, colorable argument with respect to their client without having to go back to their client and speak specifically about a piece of information. But if there was an instance where um, defense counsel were able to articulate to the court that they had to be able to present their client with some of this information in order to further the defense, the same standard would apply and the court could fashion a substitute that only the defendant could see in order to assist with the, the progression of that in-camera hearing. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, that, that those procedures um, have been established, you know, and in, in place for more than 20 years, have been repeatedly upheld, and in two big, important Court of Appeals decisions from the past year, um, upholding significant terrorism convictions, um, both the Fourth Circuit and the Second Circuit, once again reaffirmed that it is okay constitutionally under SEPA for um, clear defense counsel to have access uh, in the in-camera uh, process to the classified information to make arguments on behalf of the defendant, but that obviously the defendant himself um, and unclear defense counsel can't see the classified evidence, otherwise the whole thing falls apart. Clearance. The court. The discretion is up to the court um, in order to, whether first whether to grant clearances and to start the clearance process for defense counsel. It, it, it's the federal government that grants clearance. Ultimately, yes, but the, the court, is, the court starts, starts the process, then the regular background check is conducted, and a clearance determination is made. Is this an appealable issue? I'm not aware of that being appealed. Um, I, any issue is appealable, I suppose, but no, I don't know that I it has been. Before you, you go oh, to I trial. See. I don't think it is, but the, the process that's been in place, and the, uh, what the, one of the two opinions I referred to earlier is Abu Ali, um, a, a excellent, uh, really uh, uh, thorough and interesting Fourth Circuit opinion that uh, I recommend anybody who's interested in, in this issue in particular. Um, um, that the court will appoint um, uh, cleared counsel for the defendant if, uh, defense, if the defendant's pro se, that was the Musawi situation, or if the defendant um, defense counsel refuses to submit to the clearance procedure or is not approved, so that there is counsel uh, appointed by the court with clearance whose job it is to represent the defendant's interest in yeah, this process. But as an old-fashioned emphasis on old um, criminal defense attorney, having someone come in who's cleared for this process really would, I would think, would cripple a defense. Well, look, it's contra it's, is it, is it, has it been criticized over the years? Yeah, and, and there's other um, uh, criticisms that um, uh, have been made against SEPA. You know, there's, there's a, another point we haven't talked about, it's sort of technical, but at, at the level of even what's discoverable under SEPA, the judge can make those determinations um, ex parte in some situations. So th it, is, it is different than the normal situation with unclassified evidence, but that's because there's classified evidence. And it, 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 it's, it's hard to think of... Um, a different or better solution, and SEPA, you know, SEPA works. I mean, you talk to, to people who've litigated under SEPA, it's cumbersome, um, but it works. And judges have demonstrated over and over again um, great sensitivity and ability to kind of um, strike the balance between making sure that the defendant absolutely has a fair trial. Um, uh, but without jeopardizing national security. Ultimately, the test under SEPA is that it is only permissible um, to withhold evidence if um, the defense's right to make a, a, a full and fair defense is not compromised. And so courts, they, they, they create substitutions. And if there's a, a lot, uh, an impasse 
where there's a piece of evidence that you know, is, is important to the defense and there's no way around it, then the court is obligated under SEPA to sanction the government, either precluding evidence um, in an extreme case, um, directing a, a, a judgment of acquittal on that count. Oh, that, that's good. Sure. I'd, I'd like to clarify one thing before we go on with this. How, does, how would this be handled differently in a military tribunal under the UCMJ or in a so-called national security court? Well, let me take the first one. Uh, I'll let Glenn talk about national security court. Uh, first of all, if you're dealing with a, either court-martial or Lou, a military commission basically using the, fa the, the, the framework of courts martial, which is what's coming out of the legislation. First of all, you're going to have attorneys, military attorneys, who we've already talked about this morning, and I think we've all agreed are really honorable military lawyers. They're professionals in the dual arms of, or the dual professions of arms and law. They're going to be clear. They're going to be clear. Your jury panel, uh, which in the military, some of you know, or is, a, is an all-officer panel. Uh, they are officers, and those at Guantanamo Bay were all colonels, right, Mo? Maybe a couple of lieutenant colonels. But, so, so you're dealing with very uh, sophisticated jury members, most of whom are already been cleared, because I think that was one of the criteria for the pool, that they had to be cleared. So you don't run into the same problems. Further, you're on a military base, so you don't need to bring in a SCIF, a special compartmentalized information facility. So uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not saying, and I, I disagree with Amos, I'm not saying that the Article III courts won't work, but virtually all these cases are going to involve classified information. So we're, we're taking your kind of worst scenario and saying it's going to be the entire group. And I think it's going to really tax the system, and, and I think you acknowledge the strain in your reporting, Jim. So I think that there needs to be at least a combination of the two used. Uh, and again, I think it's significant that commissions don't have to be held in the United States. I'm one of those that does worry about court security, security of the jury panel in Federal Three and Article Three courts, judges, um, a radicalized group somehow staging a protest against the trial. These are security considerations that are huge that just make more of a problem in holding an Article Three case. And what about the national security? You want to start with an alcohol? No, go ahead. Is, uh, would be, uh, in my perception, they'd be on military basis, so a lot of the concerns that Scott's raising would be also similarly taken care of. The uh, JAGs would be supporting the federal prosecutors, who would be the lead counsel, be federal prosecutors in our national security court, who would be cleared as well. Federal public defenders, as well as defense JAGs, uh, being assigned as well as second chair in the prosecutions, in the defense of the, uh, at the National Security Court. So that's taken care of in terms of clearances. And the judges, there wouldn't be a jury issue with the National Security Court. It would be a three-panel judge, uh, federal judges, Article Three judges that would oversee it, and they would be cleared. So it wouldn't be the, the problems. And I do think it's important that the military base, the court security concerns that Scott is alluding to, I think are important for people to take into consideration when we're looking at, at, at uh, potentially embracing a pure civilian court model. And one of the items that I think, if I could, is when we're talking about this, it goes back to what General Altenberg astutely noted this morning is about grander issues about whether it's a war or not, or whether it's an armed conflict. And I think when we start talking about whether it is an armed conflict or not, it really helps us decide whether if it's, we're going to use an armed conflict model of some sort and put it into put uh, those that violate the laws of war into civilian courts. I mean, Scott's is kind of pick or choose depending on what is kind of what President Obama said as well, is depending on where they're picked up or what actions they've committed. But I think Jim's kind of embracing, regardless, just pure human rights first analysis would be purely only use civilian courts. And I think that's something we really should kind of wrestle with. Are we at, in some sort of an armed conflict, different from the past? It's like it's the all right, you got to let me respond to that, though. Okay. Hang on. Okay, <laughs> all right. I think that the, the fundamental questions I want to follow up with what Glenn said is, What's the paradigm? I mean, here we are eight years later, and Michael, where are you? Eight years later, we're, we, it's as if we had this discussion eight years ago. And we really even haven't begun the process of defining what's the conflict? What's the nature of the conflict? Who are the individuals we're in conflict with? What are their rights? What is their status? And it's as if we've been through this over and over again. And to the credit of the organizers of this conference, maybe this will indeed help us go forward. And we are, you know, in a baseball paradigm. We're somewhere between the dugout and, the, and what's called the... Um, on deck circle. We're not even between the on deck circle and home plate, eight years later. 
I think that the idea, my idea of the national, I think Glenn and I agree here, the National Security Court indeed is an alternative to provide justice to individuals who otherwise are not going to have justice rendered onto them. Because here they are, here we are eight years later still holding them. I agree there's, in an in a alternative judicial paradigm, I would not have a jury system. I think that um, anybody who's been involved in classified information knows that jurors have extraordinarily difficult time with, with classified information, especially if it comes from sources who are dealing with different cultures. And we have to remember that <clears throat> there's a fundamental difference between mob trials and terrorism trials. The information that comes out of, is related to terrorism trials overseas or information that comes from overseas is totally different from the traditional mob trial. These are different cultures, different languages, and that makes, I would suggest, a jury um, inapplicable or inappropriate for this. In making this a civilian system, you can have a JAG lawyer involved. I think JAG lawyers on both sides have done an extraordinary job. But from my perspective, this would be a federal system. You could use a FISA court, or you could create an alternative federal court without juries. You have appeals to the Court of Appeals, to the Supreme Court. You could even make this, from my perspective, the court system would be equivalent to the United States District Court. You could use district court judges. But what's important to remember, this is, these trials are fundamentally different, especially when we begin with the numbers from the trials that we've seen to date. And it's critical that we remember at all times, and I harp on this over and over again, we are presently, frankly, holding thousands of people indefinitely, and the only way to go forward is to begin the process of going forward. Yeah, I, you know, I sometimes feel like thinking about these issues that I'm old-fashioned, but, you know, we have a body of law that we are fortunate enough to have inherited <clears throat> from a lot of dedicated and smart lawyers and citizens who preceded us. And I, I think it, it, it tells us what the answer to these questions are. Your, the question is, where do you prosecute these people? Okay. By definition, you've decided to prosecute them. That takes you out of the box of the preventive detention, thousands of people overseas, and that's why, I mean, I think, Amos, I don't think, I think that the, the specter of the thousands of people being held in Afghanistan swamping the Article III court system is just not really um, the, the, the scenario that at least makes sense to me in terms of are you going to prosecute these people? It's unrealistic to prosecute So we, we, so we, keep, we keep them forever in indefinite okay. detention? So maybe, maybe not. That's a separate question. But, let's, but that's conflating the two questions of detention and prosecution. And that's saying, well, you have to prosecute them and um, have to prosecute all of them. And once you make that decision, then you can't prosecute them in Article III courts. I really think it's, again, hearkening back to General Alten, Altenberg's opening remarks this morning, really important to keep those two um, uh, 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 points separate, detention versus trial. And if you're going to, if you're in the bucket of, okay, you've decided, there's evidence, there's a violation, and there's a, a decision to bring charges, then you've got the Article III court system, been around a long time, works really well. I commend, um, you know, these reports to anybody who wants to know more about the data. There's a lot of data about the way the courts have functioned. And those reports, I think, really strongly refute many of the canards that have been offered over the years about the alleged weaknesses and deficiencies of the federal court system. The experience just doesn't bear it out. You also have the, the military uh, justice system. Not my background, not in something I'm... Uh, uh, anything close to an expert on, and I was in incredibly uh, impressed by the uh, panels this morning, an, an equal, uh, uh, equally um, a venerable body of law with equally or perhaps even um, um, more um, uh, uh, honorable traditions. And, you know, are there situations where it might be appropriate to have some of these um, individuals prosecuted through military commissions? Sure, a a analytically, you could, you could imagine, and maybe it's because of geography or other reasons. Um, could it be done right? Absolutely. I have no doubt that the m military services are fully capable of, of, of administering um, effective and fair military commissions. Has it been done effectively? No. Um, are we kind of starting from a position of weakness after eight years? Yes. 
Um, are there questions that are going to arise that someone mentioned in one of the earlier panels of, you know, if you start now with the military commissions, is there, is there going to be a perception of two classes of justice? Yeah, I worry about that a lot. So I think there are practical obstacles um, and legitimacy questions that would surround any revived military commissions. In theory, sure. Um, but if you, if you accept a reformulated, robust, fair, credible military commission system, and you line that up alongside the Article III courts, which, again, the research demonstrates have worked well, I just don't see the basis for then starting all over again with yet another court system that would be subject to challenge, whose procedures would have to be worked out, where there'd be all sorts of debates and questions about, well, sh what cases should be brought in there and what shouldn't be brought in there. So I, I, I'm sort of of the mind of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And by the way, not only is it not broke, but it's something we should be really proud of. Well, in Milliken, it's still good. Well, forget that. Yeah, yeah. Really forgot. But that's martial law. We're not talking about martial law. Well, but the basic principle, the federal courts are open. Yeah, but that's martial law. We all due respect. We're not talking about a martial law situation. But I know Glenn wants to talk. But let me, first of all, we've heard, I don't know how many times today, about it's been eight years when we only have three trials. I, I got to tell you that the first appointing authority for military commissions was Paul Wolfowitz. And this was not high on his scope of activities. And it wasn't until John took over in 04 that any, either the lawyers even got pencils and papers. So we're a little unfair to the system when we say eight years. But not to the detainees. Well. No, but not that we can't that forget that yeah, stuff. I, no, no, wait a minute, Amos. We've got to go back. We are talking two different issues. And I agree with Jim. We cannot inflate detention and prosecution because you, there are going to be an awful lot of detainees at Bagram or Guantanamo Bay that are never going to see a court of law. It's just the fact. So we need to deal in this panel with those for which there's some evidence of criminality that you can have a trial. Now, let me offer Jim kind of a, a thought. Um, I think that the bread and butter of the U.S. attorneys is material support to terrorism, either 18 U.S. Code 2339A or B, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so generally. I have a question in my own mind as to whether material support to terrorism is technically a violation of the law of war under the Constitution, under Article 1, Section 8. So that's a, a problem potentially for military commissions, is prosecuting that material support. That was an issue in Hamdan. Well, it, it, it is. Appealed, it right? is. And, yep. and, but as of right now, the Senate bill still has it in it. So I would think that you could take some of the cases that you guys could run through on 2339A and B cases, but you only get 15 years account for those. Last time I checked, they haven't increased it. So it's 15 years account. Whereas if you could take some of the other cases for which there's an awful lot of classified, that you could take murder cases, and because the military commissions are much more collapsed in time, you can go from findings to sentencing within a day. The attorneys have to be prepared to go all the way. You could do it more efficiently than a Masawi case that's still on appeal uh, and, and takes an awful lot of time to prosecute. So I, I think that a careful division of the cases could be made looking at the type of evidence available, the type of charge which is appropriate. And there are some cases that I would argue are more appropriate for military commissions for geography or because of the substantive offense. And there are some that should properly be pried in the Article Three courts, like material support to terrorism cases. All right, let's get Glenn and then Justin. I just think we have two, uh, two quick, quick items. When we're talking about prosecuting these folks, and again, I think we have to go to whether this is an armed conflict or not, and in traditional armed conflict, uh, are we going to start saying that it's okay to bring folks who capture on the field of battle into our Article III courts as well, which I'm not certain Jim answered when he responded before about how he views it as an armed conflict or a law enforcement action, either a, kind of the way we viewed it prior to 9-11 or, or afterwards. I mean, I think it runs, becomes confusing for us if we don't necessarily focus on the nature of this conflict, whatever it may be or however we may categorize it. There can be just one person carrying out operations in the United States that we might say would go through an Article III court or conspiring to engage in, in, in acts of terrorism in the United States, talking with someone over in, in Yemen or in wherever at the time, discussing, we, we're, we're setting up a system where we're providing two, a bifurcated process, which I don't think is actually healthy, where we can look to something, and we should be as lawyers. We should be proud of our traditions of the Article III courts. We're certainly proud of our military traditions. That doesn't mean we stay stuck and try to jam a square peg into a round hole, maybe look for other solutions. We shouldn't just stay rigidly aligned with something that we are comfortable with or think is good, but maybe look at 21st century warfare as being unique and different and not sacrifice any of those principles that we hold dear for the sake of just expediency. And the other one is just the last, when we're talking about this, I think we're, we have to be careful to look 
at the 75 to 100 that the president hasn't actually figured out might go into civilian court or military commissions. And the folks that are on the commissions for the president are looking at those very seriously. So I think our alternative we're talking about, do we want from this conference to sit and look and say it's okay to engage in preventative detention? Because that's the third alternative for maybe 50 to 75 or maybe thousands, as, as Amos alluded to. Or do we want to say we should find some way to ensure they do get tried, but tried in an appropriate venue and in an appropriate fashion? Because I think that's really one of the areas we have to be concentrating on. There's going to be 50 to 75, at least just from Guantanamo, who they don't know what to do with. Uh, there are two points I also want to make. One, one is, and I think that this informs this, this discussion about where do we end up trying these cases. The first is, when we talk about classified evidence, I don't have any statistics like, like Jim would be able to produce to, to back this up, but my perception is that much more inculpatory evidence is left on the table for prosecutors in Article III courts than exculpatory information, if there is any. Um, that is to say that prosecutors typically have to walk away from a tremendous amount of, what, of information that would be very helpful, evidence that would be very helpful in their case, um, in order to prosecute these cases in Article III courts. Um, so to the extent that that informs this debate, I think it's important that, and I, and I think uh, Captain uh, Sumacy on, touched on this. The second point I want to make is that uh, we keep talking about trials and, uh, and, and prosecution as, a, as the trial, um, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into a case prior to it ever being charged. And I, I, I guess I'm being parochial about this, but my perception is that um, the, a lot of these investigations, when they occur in the United States, they cannot all be done from one centralized location. And if we're talking about a national security court where these charging decisions are going to be made, uh, I think it's inevitable that that sort of centralization of the investigatory function would occur as well. And I, I don't know that that is, from a policy standpoint, the best way to investigate these cases. Um, especially when we're talking about local threats or individuals who may be very, very localized in their relationships. Um, and, and I have to disagree with Amos on this. A lot of these cases are very similar to mob cases. You have informants, you have cooperators, um, you have uh, electronic surveillance in a lot of these cases. And there are quite a few similarities between a terrorism case, at least as it's, as it's developed in our Article III courts here in the United States. That is a case that originated out of the United States, typically has some sort of international ties, um, but there are a lot of similarities between those types of cases and the run-of-the-mill organized crime case. All right. As I suspected, we haven't reached any agreement <laughs> on this issue. But let's talk about some specifics under each of the different approaches that have been suggested here. Um, how do you deal with the question of confrontation and cross-examination? I'm a prosecutor, so I, I, that's, well, the, Sixth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment doesn't, doesn't, unfortunately doesn't apply to me because it, it would be helpful in some ways to be guaranteed effective cross-examination. But for defense attorneys... Actually, I was talking about it from the other <laughs> Yeah, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the government uh, always the, this is, the, the Sixth Amendment, and, and, and as we know, this, the Supreme Court is um, really buttressing the Sixth Amendment case law, um, and it's becoming... Um, much, much more important to uh, prosecutions. That is guaranteeing um, defendants the ability to, to cross-examine in the wake of a uh, decision called Crawford. So uh, the Sixth Amendment is very important. Um, and the way that it's done, typically, if, it's, if we're talking about classified information here, um, if, it's, if it's unclassified, it's generally going to be discoverable, um, barring some sort of uh, particular reason for the prosecution to withhold it, usually done with court approval. But the problem is only going to be where it's... Classified. classified. And that's where, that's where SEPA comes into play. And SEPA allows for, so that is to say, let's say, for instance, that there was a prior statement by a witness um, that was uh, classified for some reason. Um, SEPA would allow for a substitution of the substance of that statement to allow for effective cross-examination, whatever the, whatever the particular content was that the defense attorneys would be entitled to. Um, defense attorneys could then cross-examine that witness with that witness's prior statement. Um, in an unclassified substitution. So that is to say, there would be certain pieces of information that would not indicate where that statement came from, who, to whom it was made in some instances, um, when it was made, if that, if, if that weren't necessary. I assume the same thing applies in military prosecutions. What about the national security? In my national security proposal, the problem with my proposal, I'm the first one to say it, the problem with my proposal, 
best defense is a good offense. I thought we were supposed to say Amos is right. <laughs> <laughs> they learn. <laughs> okay, all right, Amos okay. Right. All right. There are problems. <laughs> <laughs> is that I allow for the presentation of classified evidence information ex parte without the lawyer and, his, um, and the client present. That's an inherent weakness in terms of the Confrontation Clause, in terms of the Sixth Amendment. On the other hand, on the other hand, because not to heart, but because I do believe that a preventive detention paradigm is not a proper way to go forward, and because I do believe we have to go forward with trials of those individuals being detained, that the most effective way to do that is to begin their trials even at the cost or the expense of, of um, introducing classified information ex parte. It is a, some kind of a balanced approach. What's the approach under the current military commission? Well, no, I mean, the, the Military Commissions Act of 2006 uh, as it's being enhanced by the Senate. There's not a whole lot of difference. Uh, there is a CEPA rule that's contained. It's, it's RCM 505. It's virtually identical to the CEPA. Um, under SEPA, the Attorney General has to be the one to say, we're not going to release this information. Then, as Jim said, sanctions are taken. That's exactly what happened in the Masawi case. Judge Brinkema had to take sanctions and, and restrict it. And then you had this bouncing back and forth with the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. But there's one thing, Lou, that I, I think we need to understand, that when the military commission order of President Bush came out on November 13th, that was an extremely rudimentary, rud rudimentary, 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 rudimentary system that no one agreed had due process. It was only until the military attorneys started to get involved with regard to writing the manual, uh, building on that, then you had the Military Commissions Act where Congress responded to the criticisms in Hamdan. And now the current legislation, again, takes it up about 95%. So uh, to say that this is an inherently unfair system, I think is a misstatement. It's really more a question that we should be dealing with is what is the more appropriate forum not considering whether one is fair and the other is unfair, that's not the issue. It's which is the more appropriate to the circumstance of each particular case. I think that's a decision that has to be made. Let's talk about the next issue, confessions. Right. You know, last, a year ago there was the imagery that candidate Obama, now President Obama, wanted Osama bin Laden Mirandized. Yeah. Um, you know, which was an absurdity from the moment it was spoken, but it created the imagery that its creators intended. What are we going to do about these confessions? And right. It's, well, it's, uh, th there is an issue around Miranda and confessions. It is not the issue that is sort of out there, you know, uh, in, poli in, in the politicized uh, arena. Um, you know, it, it's, it is an absurdity to suggest that um, those who advocate federal court prosecutions of terrorists are necessarily saying that soldiers in the field need to be reading people their rights. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, um, so Miranda um, is a rule of federal criminal procedure, which says that when law enforcement engages in custodial interrogation, um, absent um, a recognized exception, of which there are some and of which... Some of those are relevant. Um, absent a recognized exception, uh, the police have to read someone their rights and they have to waive the rights. Otherwise, a, um, a, a confession is not admissible in the prosecution's case in chief, though it may be admissible to impeach or in rebuttal. Um, another exception that's not uh, often noted. Um, so uh, does Miranda uh, apply uh, to um, battlefield interrogations? No one knows. Does it apply to intelligence interrogations? No case law. Um, the issue was raised and briefed in the John Walker Lind case. Um, he was apprehended um, on the battlefield in Afghanistan, held in military custody, interrogated, and indicted and brought uh, before a federal court in Virginia. And there was a suppression hearing um, scheduled with the uh, military folks who were part of his interrogation in court ready to testify, um, and then he pled. Um, there is uh, some reason, so there's some uncertainty actually 
as to whether Miranda even would apply at all. And there's cre credible arguments, I think, that could be made that it shouldn't because it's designed to um, uh, guide the behavior of law enforcement in the United States. It's got nothing to do with um, soldiers and the conduct of war. I think we're all in agreement on that. And the Senate bill, by the way, codifies it, says it does not apply. But right. Let's get beyond Miranda. No, the voluntariness standard would well, still be applicable. Sure, absolutely. And uh, the, to the extent there were statements procured through waterboarding and other, uh, um, I don't know what the euphemism is, enhanced interrogation, torture, torture no. obviously. <laughs> none, none of that's admissible. <laughs> uh, AK <yeah>. torture. <laughs> no, it sh shouldn't happen and it's not admissible and in my absolutely. view shouldn't be admissible in any respectable court Anyone system. I just think we have to be careful um, about the voluntariness side of it and armed conflict and ongoing military operations, even then as much as Miranda sounds perhaps silly to some in the room, certainly the voluntariness issue comes, comes into play, certainly in battlefield confessions. And voluntariness every time, and I think we have to be conscious why another weakness in the civilian court is any good defense counsel is going to blow this right, open this door up immediately and, and put a Mack truck through that opening that there's a voluntariness in any confession and you're leading by having this sort of weakness, by trying to force this round peg into a square hole, um, you're going to continue to have these sorts of problems trying to force a civilian law enforcement model onto war ongoing warfare operations. What, what, what's interesting is uh, that the administration is actually still taking the position that voluntariness ought to be uh, in the standard military commissions. Now, that's not in the Senate bill, but Admiral McDonald testified to that, and Jay Johnson did too. Uh, I, I don't think the Senate's going to incorporate it, but I've got a question I don't know the answer to. But if you're in federal trial, guys, uh, and you've got a, a statement that was taken out of some extremely coercive conditions, which now under the Senate bill, it's going to be the identical thing to UCMJ. You can't introduce anything. Does the fruit of the poison tree doctrine go? Because, you, you see, I'm not, I don't know how much constitutional protection other than habeas is going to extend to those, for instance, at Guantanamo Bay. If you bring them in to the Article III courts, I think clearly a whole lot more will. I think less will accrue to them if you prosecute them outside the United States in a commission, because then you're following the statute that Congress has created. I don't know the answer to that, but it causes me to be a little concerned that you're going to accrue further constitutional protection, including through the poison tree. So the clean teams down there, still not going to be able to get it in. But without getting into the Article Three Military Commission debate again, um, by but your assumption just says we're going to sacrifice fundamental constitutional principles, and it's easier to do it by going this route rather than the Article Three courts. Um, what about those fundamental <laughs> principles, and aren't we, aren't we, going to expect ourselves to live up to them? Well, I think it's important to note with respect to the Fifth Amendment, it is a trial right. So that is, it, it only is triggered when the decision is made to actually put someone on trial and introduce the evidence of whatever their, their compelled testimony would be. Um, that, that is when it is triggered. So when we talk about, and I also have a question, and, and I don't know the answer to this one, which is, can the Senate or any is there any congressional action that can legislate around Miranda? They tried that before, and it didn't work. And uh, I, I don't know to the, ex the extent to which that would be taken into consideration if we're going to talk about trying to uh, legislate around Miranda. Um, now, Miranda is a little bit flexible, especially when we talk about the overseas situations. Um, sure. In the Southern District of New York, the Bin Laden case um, allows for a little bit of flexibility um, in terms of whether an attorney is available. So. Uh, but to get back to the fruit of the poisonous tree question, that, that is typic that's actually not an uncommon issue uh, in a lot of criminal cases. Um, and as it is with most of these instances, it's a fact-based inquiry by the court. Um, takes into account a number of different factors. But there are cases where Miranda can cure um, what would be an inadmissible uh, involuntary statement if there's enough time that's gone by, if the, the proper procedures were, were in place. One more question before we get questions from the floor. What's the role of habeas corpus here? Is it going to play a continuing role? We heard this morning that the Supreme Court got everything wrong. They didn't, did they? 
I, I kind of think that goes to the, to the detention question really more than the trial question. Um, you know, habeas corpus doesn't really come into play in a prosecution scenario until after the person has been convicted and the appeals are final. Right, but aren't some of these proceedings going to have to be reviewed? Well, but, but it's already built in. Uh, right now, you've got a court military commission review that then goes to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, petition to the Supreme Court. Under the Senate bill, you throw out this military commission review court, put in the well-established Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, then to the Supreme Court by petition. So the review is already there. I agree with Jim. I think habeas is a non-issue when you're talking about prosecution. And I think there's a danger in conflating these two issues because then it becomes a very blurry issue. You have to deal with each separately because there are going to be thousands who you're going to have to question, are you going to detain them? But there's never going to be any evidence of criminality to bring before some type of prosecutorial form. And that's, I think, what we're trying to yeah. talk about here. I, just for a second, I totally agree with the need to separate between detention and trial. That said, if we're going to ignore the status of these individuals, then we're going to continue the present paradigm, which is extremely problematic. So detention here, trial here, but at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves a numbers question. I know you don't like the numbers question. I know this, Jim. We've been through this. <laughs> but the numbers question is not irrelevant. We need to ask ourselves how many people on the thousands presently detained are going to be brought to trial. You detain them, and then you try them. But how many people are going to be brought to trial? Zero out of 400,000 in World War II, but right? Since, since, so, <laughs> yeah, but since Boumediene, um, we have had 200 filings in the, the district court of which 37 have been heard. That has been since last what, June. But that's pure habeas. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Right that's now. not we're a criminal talking, prosecution. No, but we're talking right now about we're talking about habeas. The question was whether what we thought about habeas in the process, and I think that's something just to be aware of that numbers do count that way. Numbers if matter. Somebody, if, if somebody but if says, you, if you, if the government tomorrow were to indict those 200 habeas petitioners, every single one of those cases, I would think, would go away. Clearly. Just a hang over. You said there were 400,000, but again, paradigms are critical. That was a prisoner of war paradigm. This is something different. It goes back to what we said earlier, earlier panels. We've got to define what this is. This is. These are not POWs. These are people who are being detained, and then we need to figure out what are we going to do with them. Those who are going to be brought to trial, we need to bring them to trial. And that is a that is I a, a so to say Amos Amos is right. Uh, the uh, you, there's no question. That's a huge. It's a huge and hugely important question. What do you do with the thousands of people who are being held in Afghanistan? The and the, the whatever number it turns out to be at Guantanamo. Personally, I hope it's you know zero. But the number of people who the government determines can't be released and can't be prosecuted and have to continue to be held. You know, they're going to be those people. Yeah, like, and and what do you do with them? Hard question. I think that's what the last panel talked about. You know, we can talk about it, but that's different than what do you. How do you handle a prosecution? There, there, we we let's disagree on that. Harken back to our sorry history. Sorry, there were no reviews of the Japanese internment as to whether any of those individuals, as individuals, represented any sort of threat. The only review was whether they individuals in the camps could join the military. You know, there's a there's a just one Let's, more point. There's a fundamental disagreement here, which is which is great. Because Jim says we have to look at it, you know, maybe theoretically. I know you're with him. So when I, got, I know that we have to look at this theoretically. I'm saying we have to look at it practically from the perspective of the individual detained presently over the course of the past eight years. That's the, one of the fundamental differences. Let's start with questions. I got you. Who, now, of what the nature of the claims against these 75 or 100 people are, and what generally is the evidence that it's appropriate or, or available to, to be offered against them? Probably other people in the room would be better equipped to answer, but I think just generally the 230 or so that are being held, that we're throwing out the 75 to 100 number, that's been said of folks that are likely to be viewed as being unable to be tried in either venue, either the civilian court or the military court. Thus, that's what I'm most concerned about, and I'd hope that others are as well, is what to do with that 75. And I think it's easy to say, we'll just keep them in administrative detention and keep them to the end of hostilities when we know in this war on terror, which the general alluded to this morning, we don't know how to declare 
an end to it. So that's what keeping them for a lifetime of detention on what perhaps they could do in the future. I, I think the 75 is a high figure, to be honest with you. I think we're reasonably talking about 50 or so. But, but your point is, of the 226 that are still there, the vast majority, is, is, as far as I can tell, there is no sufficient evidence of criminality of a violation of either federal law or military commission law. So you cannot prosecute them. They were picked up on the battlefield. We, they, we bought them from the Northern Alliance for 5,000 head. We do not know enough about them, and we surely do not have evidence to bring a criminal case. Now, you know, we talked about this back and forth. That's a detention issue. How do you do that? That's the last panel. But of the number that we're talking about of either going to criminal court in Article 3 or military commission or some other prosecutorial forum, that's a very small number. Thank you. Please gentlemen over here, please. Mo can answer that question better than I can. <laughs> Just a quick comment and then a question. Uh, the clean teams you brought up, that's a, the paper I did for the for the conference talks about when the high value detainees showed up and the decisions we had to make. And one was the decision to employ the clean teams. We figured we had nothing to lose by trying. I mean, it's come out publicly what was done to some of these guys before they got to Guantanamo. So I think you can see where we looked at that and said, we've got nothing to lose by trying. Mm -hmm. uh, the more difficult decision, the one in the paper I said, if I had to do over again, I would reconsider, is not, in we debated whether to include Miranda rights in the cleansing statement that the FBI did a very thorough job of administering. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind, having watched some of the, inter the interviews that were done, that the FBI went to great lengths to make it clear that, look, this is your choice, and that we're, we're different guys, and we don't care what happened in the past. This is your choice. No penalty for not cooperating, no reward for cooperating. It's clearly voluntary, but we left out Miranda, and the fear was we acknowledged in 2007 that Miranda rights existed. We were saying that the thousands of interviews had been done prior to that on all the non-high value detainee cases, you know, the same right would have applied to those. And so, as I said in the paper, my fear about losing the non-high value cases is probably for naught if it winds up meaning the high value detainee cases can't be prosecuted because of that. The question I'd ask though is you talked about national solutions. You know, terrorism is an international problem. It's not unique to the United States. Piracy is another example of an international problem there's no good solution to. So why not an international terrorism tribunal? Because I think, Mo, if I can, to have an international terror court, Mo, would require the international community to agree on what terrorism is. And the chances of that happening are the chances of me having a ponytail. <laughs> yeah. yeah I this mean, is right. Huh? You'd, have to create an ad hoc, you'd have to create an ad hoc tribunal like former Yugoslavia or Rwanda. I think it's going to take time. You've got to go to the Security Council. It's got to be under Chapter 7. I, I just don't see the reality of that happening. And the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction before June of 2002. And, and yet, anyway. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I also think that, that that presupposes international cooperation on both the law enforcement and intelligence fronts, intelligence fronts and, and that there could be uh, enough suspension of uh, national interest in order to, to fuse together a truly international terrorism prosecution. I, I, it may be possible. It's been done. We, we certainly have cooperative uh, international partners. It also presupposes that the United States would even consider such a proposal. It, I mean, just to add one thought to pick up on what Justice said, I mean, it is, it is uh, essential to have effective uh, coordination and cooperation with overseas um, law enforcement and military and intelligence uh, uh, authorities. Um, and that um, is another area where um, over time the, the, the record shows, I think, quite clearly that the court system has been able to make accommodations that respect the, um, the requirements of foreign law enforcement and that enable those relationships to build confidence to be sown and for cooperation to continue. And just one, picking up on the, on the uh, question about confrontation, um, another um, facet of that issue, which relates to this uh, point about international coordination, is you know, the problem of um, witnesses located overseas who uh, are willing to cooperate in the prosecution and the investigation, but are not, for whatever reason, able or willing to travel to the United States. How do you deal with that, right? And, 
the, the norm um, under Supreme Court Confrontation Clause law is the defendant has a right to face-to-face -face confrontation in the courtroom. Um, so in the uh, a, a, a Court of Appeals case from the, the past year, the Fourth Circuit um, considered the, uh, in the Abu Ali case the situation where the defendant had a U.S. citizen, native of Northern Virginia, who had moved to Saudi Arabia, become radicalized, joined an al-Qaeda cell, and plotted to kill the president, among other things, um, where this defendant was captured in Saudi Arabia, interrogated at some length by the Saudi intelligence authorities, and gave uh, extensive video videotaped confessions. The defendant was then indicted, brought to the United States, and a key piece of evidence was these confessions. But you needed to have the Saudi interrogators available to authenticate the confessions and to be cross-examined about the circumstances under which the confessions were procured. Well, the Saudis wouldn't travel to the U.S. There was a provision in the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure uh, in extraordinary circumstances for um, depositions to occur overseas, but you have to have, traditionally have to have the defendant there. They weren't going to bring Abu Ali back to Saudi Arabia. Um, and so the trial judge devised an innovative um, so, uh, solution with a two-way real-time video monitoring link with uh, one set of defense counsel in the room in Saudi Arabia, another in the courtroom with the judge and the defendant in Virginia, um, extensive, you know, private, secure communication links between the defendant and his attorneys in Saudi Arabia, and um, the Fourth Circuit uh, upheld it as consistent with the Confrontation Clause, emphasizing that these were the kinds of um, decisions that are necessary in order to ensure co cooperation and coordination with our international partners. Sixteen months ago, uh, Susan Crawford, who succeeded General Altenberg as the convening authority and is still the convening authority of the military commissions, announced that in the case of Katani, that she was going to dismiss the case because the acts of torture that she found, and those were her words, were so shocking that she did not think the U.S. government could go forward. My question to you all is, you know, obviously a federal government, uh, uh, Article Three court, would have the same kind of reaction, but does this alternative um, national security court give you a venue to prosecute that kind of case, no. or is that kind of case just a dead end? Dead end. And and so we, we tortured him, and therefore he spends the rest of his life in indefinite detention because there's nothing we can do with him? From my perspective, the national security court proposal that I have you know, submitted, on issues such as what Michael's raised here, absolutely and totally that kind of confession would have to be thrown out and would not in any way be admissible for anything. In that sense, the, con the confession of voluntariness, coercive interrogation standard in my proposal is absolutely equivalent to an Article Three court with no I, ands. Just if to interrupt for a second. I don't think wait. it was a case of confession. But I, no, I think the issue was just sort of the supervisory authority and the taint of the court system because of torture. The hang on. Torture is torture. And whether it's in an Article Three paradigm or a military commission paradigm or a national security court paradigm, there are no ands, ifs, or buts, and under no condition would that be admissible. But your proposal would require that this detainee brought, be brought to the national. He would be brought, but if, if but hang on, but if the if the confession was a result of torture, it would be absolutely inadmissible. All right. So if it's inadmissible, he's not going to be relegated back to detention for life. Is it? If if at the end of the day we're holding somebody based on a, on a, confe on a confession that was predicated on torture then I would suggest there is no justification for his continued detention, and that individual would have to be released. Similar in, in, in mind that torture is not permissible, any sort of tainted evidence like that the judge could kick out. And I think it's important, again, sorry to go back to the habeas and trial issues, but within you have to try to do that proper balance, knowing that it is this hybrid war and balance national security and human rights perspectives. So you do have to provide a habeas hearing through these special judges, national security judges that are learned, and have a trial initiated within one year. So either at the habeas stage, which, which in my vision is within three months of capture, is a chance for intelligence professionals to still glean information from the point of capture if it was inappropriately done during the habeas. It's, it's charged, and, and the trial portion would be initiated within a year. I tried to clarify this, but this is not a case where it was the confession that kicked the case out. They had other evidence, solid evidence other than the confession. So it wasn't a tainted confession being left out. It was that the conduct and treatment was so shocking that they thought under the supervisory authority, they just had to dismiss the case. They couldn't go forward. And still that's that would exist. No, that would exist within the national security court system that I espouse, and I believe Amos as well. Can I, can I just add one uh, word to that? 
It's actually, I don't think it's so clear that in a federal court, even in that scenario, the case gets dismissed. Um, there is some, uh, an older a precedent from um, the Second Circuit, which suggests that in some circumstances, if you have U.S. Uh, government uh, officials Tus engaging in, in, tor in the Tuscanino case, engaging in torture, that, you know, it's conduct that shocks the conscience and the court kicks the case. But, you know, there's some Supreme Court precedent, the, the Kerr and Frisbee, which um, uh, basically hold that, you know, doesn't, you know, whatever happened before the defendant was brought into the U.S. court system, you know, doesn't really, um, does, does not defeat, the, even if the defendant is mistreated, the, the U.S. Uh, court's jurisdiction, um, you know, it continues to exist. Toscanino hasn't really been tested. Um, there's a bunch of subsequent Court of Appeals case law from different circuits that tends to cast doubt on it. So it's, that, it's a question, and it does, you know, uh, to me, if, if Khalid Sheikh Mohammed does um, get brought to the Southern District. Um, I'm sure that's going to be um, one of the pretrial motions is a Toscanino motion. It'll be interesting to see what, what happens. But I do think it's good in a national security court system we have judges that are Article Three judges but are learned in this niche area of the law to make that determination. I think it adds more credibility to a decision like that. All right, Keith. One of the most important legacies from the Nuremberg Tribunal was the historical record that it left of the Nazi atrocities. Uh, Justin, I believe it was you that commented, if we are making these forum decisions, um, if we choose one forum of the other, over the other, we may instantly be losing um, some inculpatory evidence. So we just leave that on the table. Should that play a role? Should the documentation, the historical record, play a role in our choice of forum between commissions and the federal courts? Um, well... I think that your, your question, what, what it really gets, what we're getting to the heart of here is, is that information ever going to be released? Um, is it ever going to be releasable? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. So, so some of the information could be of such a, a sensitive nature, could come from such a source or such a method that it will never be disclosable, in, w in which case there is going to be no historical record other than what exists in the intelligence community. It's getting beyond the classified information issues. I think the answer is yes, we are. I mean, if, if, to the extent that that is uh, in some ways the truth or a shade of the truth or is a piece of the fabric that we get to to get to the truth. Um, but that happens every day in courts, uh, that, that you're not allowed to use some piece of evidence. The jury is not allowed to, to hear something on the record. Um, and and in, in some ways, that's just inevitable in, in any court proceeding, I think. Uh, yeah. we, have to, we have to leave that out. The only thing I'd suggest, Justin, is these are just not ordinary criminal trials. I understand that. So we're, we're talking about folks who have been down in Guantanamo Bay or held somewhere else for a long period of time. The American people and the international community are watching to see what we do. So I, I don't think we can just say, well, you know, that's just not going to mm -hmm. get there. I, th I think we, we, we've got to find a way through a combination of forms to make sure that as many cases are dealt with as possible because I think we have a responsibility to as the people. Quick, as quickly as possible. And as quickly, and that's why, again, why I think military commissions, I don't want to get back into that, but I mean, they can be done more efficiently mm -hmm. than a federal trial. What role will rehabilitating U.S. Rep reputation in the world play in the selection of a Well, I think, jumping in, as one who spends a fair amount of his time overseas, um, both in Europe and the Middle East, I think it's fair to state that clearly the United States' reputation has taken an enormous hit. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And without getting into politics, it seems to be one of the efforts of the present president is to try to restore that reputation. That said, again, without getting into the numbers, the numbers issue is a serious concern overseas. And that needs to be clearly articulated. People, when, they, when you talk to people overseas, they're not talking about the 72 people in Guantanamo. They're seeing the overall picture. And they are asking themselves, how is this administration going to go forward with beginning some kind of resolution of that, of that number? Not the 72, but the thousands. 
I think, Lou, if you're going to talk about the reputational question, that reputational question is directly related to the thousands of detainees. I, I think that, again, depending upon what comes out of the Congress, if we come out with a system of revisions that satisfy not only common Article 3, Prong 4, but also the full panoply of rights under Article 75 of the Additional Protocol, and I think if we explain that to the international community, we've already got a Supreme Court case that says that's the gold standard. I think it's a question of persuading not only our own people, but the international community, that this is going to be a fair system. Uh, it was said this morning, I don't think we ought to pitch a very efficient, competent, prosecutorial forum just because it did not work the first time. I, I think we owe it to ourselves to try to explore every possible way to deal with these folks that we have said are the worst of the worst and bring them to a prosecutorial forum if there is some evidence. And if it's the federal courts, so be it. If it's military commissions, so be it. If it's some other forum, so be it. But I don't think we should be hung up on the stain of the past as far as it goes forward to the future. I think it's critical, actually, with all due respect to Scott, to. Uh sideline the military commissions and move forward. I think they're tainted irrevocably, and unfortunately, we want to preserve them, in my perspective, for traditional armed conflict in the future. And one way to ensure that they're not used again in the future, when they would be more appropriate, when the violators of the laws of the war are the exception and not the norm. And what we're trying to do with military commissions now is take an Al-Qaeda fighter is, by nature, by being part of that organization, they're illegal combatants and enemy combatants, if you will, and thus we're every one of them has to go before a military commission. We want to preserve this tool of military justice for future traditional armed conflict. And by using it now, all we're doing is hurting ourselves and not allowing us to regain the initiative within the world community. I'll make this, this, yeah, yeah. I'll make the statement a question. So, uh, having read Hamdan, uh, isn't the problem still, there was a point raised in an earlier panel if you have new laws and new laws and new laws, it's still all post hoc. And Hamdan said you can't have a regularly constituted court post hoc uh, and comply with Common Article 3 unless the uh, tribunal's been created under previously extant rules of law. So you change the rules of law. You can't go back in time. What about that? Um, and you know, the public, in terms of image, it's going to be a little suspicious, I think, that if a regular courts work with fair procedures that have been worked out in view of the Constitution, why do we need a special tribunal for quick trials? Isn't there something sneaky about this tribunal? I mean, especially in terms of the kind of evidence that's going to be received. I mean, in terms of image, you're, you're not being able to fool the child who says, uh, this tribunal's naked. Are you talking about tribunals now? One, I don't, I don't read. Uh, new, uh, oh, oh, but he is. Or new rules uh, changing the military commission. Either way. Talking about alternatives. All post hoc. Wait, the MCA is. At least look at it all three. We'll all hop on you. Military, <laughs> military Commissions Act is post hoc. It, and, the new, and the new one coming out from the Senate would be. But I think when you're talking about legitimacy, and it certainly is something we should be concerned about, but we have to also, while we're still trying to garner this greater international support and regain the initiative in the, in the war against al-Qaeda and from the international community, I think we also still have to protect the national security. We have to be conscious of that balance. We can't sit and overplay our obligations where the civilian courts, with all due respect, yes, they've worked in some instances, but they're not going to work on battlefield prosecutions. If we take battlefield uh, illegal combatants and bring them back to our civilian courts, we're opening up real problems for the soldiers and Marines on the ground fighting this war. Um, I think we're really opening up Pandora's box. We don't want to start having civilian prosecutions for war crimes. It's why we have the UCMJ. We have a separate federal criminal justice system for violations because it's a unique subset of society with different objectives and desires within, within the legal structure. Let's go down the line. All right. Hamdan, one, is not a constitutional rule. The Supreme Court did not say military commissions were unconstitutional. It said it, said it was in conflict with Article 2136. What the Congress did in the Military Commissions Act, what it's done in the new legislation, it says it is not creating new offenses. It is only codifying those offenses which have traditionally been considered violations of law of war. That's when you get into the material support for terrorism. Is that a, is that a violation of law of war? I have a real question about that. But nonetheless, 
I don't think you're going to have the problem that you suggest if we are talking about using a military commission to prosecute traditional violations of the law of war. And that's what Congress has in. There's a spe separate statement. It's in the Military Commissions Act of 2006. It's also in the new legislation that it is not creating new offenses. Amos? Jordan, I'm, I'm well aware of, of, the, of the, well, the risks and the dangers and the, pitfall, the patfalls and the pitfalls, whichever, of creating alternative judicial paradigms, in its essence, what Glenn and I are recommending. I'm well aware, as is Glenn, we've talked about this. On the other hand, I'm well aware of the danger of not providing a workable solution. I think the present system is not a workable solution. I think the military commissions was not a workable solution. And that then leads me to the maybe unfortunate, unpleasant conclusion that we need to take Article Three, restructure it, and create a, a new system. Because this is going to be unfeasible, and this has not worked. Yes. I think one of the fundamental questions that has to get answered with respect to this, these proposed national security courts is, are these cases that will be, uh, will it be limited to cases that arise overseas on the battlefield, or will this encompass all cases that are, quote, unquote, terrorism? Um, and and I, I don't know the answer to that only because I'm not familiar with all the details of your plans. But I, I think that it's going to be a real hard sell if um, the court envisions prosecuting uh, individuals who may be right here in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, part of a cell, are plotting, even if they're in involved with people overseas, um, and you want to take those people out of the local jurisdiction and, and put them in a, in a separate court system. I, I think that's a, a much tougher sell than if you focus it on specifically those detained on the battlefield. Jim? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I think I have a lot to add to what I had to say before, except that, you know, the Article Three courts, one of their great strengths, apart from the fact that they work, um, is that they're credible. And, you know, um, Ramzi Yosef and the Blind Sheik have been sitting in federal prison for, you know, a lot of years, and I don't think they've gotten too much sympathy. Uh, they haven't been a rallying point for anti-American sentiment. Um, their convictions were thoroughly reviewed and upheld by the Second Circuit. And if we're capable of successfully prosecuting a Ramzi Yosef or a Blind Sheik or the embassy bombers or Musawi, um, and, I, you know, many others as well. Um, those, to me, are the paradigmatic, you know, al-Qaeda bad guys. Um, we indicted Khalid Sheikh Mohammed back in the 90s. Um, uh, we should prosecute him, and we should get on with it. Well, we've come full circle. Everyone has had a chance to summarize his original position. We have time for one quick question. Uh, Amos, of course, is right. There are 10,000 uh, detainees in Iraq, over 800 in Afghanistan. Um, where he's wrong and where Jim is right is, fortunately, we're in still in a recession. There are a lot of lawyers who need work, and uh, we can put them to work. Well, I, I'm not a I'm not a an expert on on civil law or tort law, but it's basic. The, the way I understand it, it's permissible if the government allows it to be permissible under the, for, the Federal Tort Claims Act. But that is the root of the issue, I think, with the case that you're referring to. That's a hell of a transparent standard, isn't it? That's what the law says. I'm just. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. See, I'm. Yeah. You. You usually do. <laughs> um, I'd like to be able to say that Amos is right because apparently we're supposed to. Um, but uh, with regard to the detainees in um, Afghanistan and Iraq, I wasn't in the room when we were told that the Supreme Court has gotten all of the habeas cases wrong, so I don't know what's wrong with Boumediene. Assuming that Boumediene is correctly decided, Hasn't, the, hasn't that question of the extension of Boumediene been dealt with, I think, very well and clearly in the Michaela decision, which essentially says, look, if you were found on the field of battle, then you need some sort of um, uh, combatant review 
tribunal to determine whether or not you are indeed a combatant, and that's consistent with in the requirements of international law. And on the other hand, if we're using Bagram as the new Guantanamo and we're picking up people in Bosnia or in the Philippines and depositing them in Bagram, then um, they're entitled to habeas review. And we're not talking in that case about tens of thousands of cases. We're talking about a small number of cases. You're, you're talking about three. You're, you're referring to Judge Bates' opinion. Yes. Yeah. Uh, some have criticized that opinion as saying taking Kennedy's factors of Boumediene and doubling them and then comparing Bagram to Guantanamo Bay and trying to do that matrix. It's on appeal. We're still waiting on the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Uh, a, a lot of it's going to depend on the three-judge panel on that. Uh, my guess, and only my guess, knowing the judges on that court, are you're going to get a reversal there. But then it's going to go to the Supreme Court, clearly. So we're going to have a chance to see at last exactly what the Supreme Court meant in Boumediene that it did not say. In other words, how far beyond Gitmo does it extend? The problem with Judge Bates' ruling is that if, in fact, you extend it to Bagram, then there is no other, there's no limit on it because you can extend it virtually anywhere where you're holding people in detention, which creates a very difficult circumstance for the military. So uh, I, I don't know what the result's going to be. I think it's going to have to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, Bates may be right, he may not be right, but it's going to be probably a year before we find out. But, I'm just going to uh, uh, carry that a little bit further and say that uh, with, with Boumediene, it's interesting because I, where I do find it faulty is, is that it um, provides more rights and a constitutional right, at least one isolated just to the folks at Guantanamo, um, than would a legitimate prisoner of war during periods of legitimate armed conflict and traditional armed conflict. Did the court really want to grant that constitutional right to folks that purposely violate the laws of war when it's not afforded to prisoners of war in traditional armed conflict. I would hope they wouldn't. And I guess we're going to have to wait to hear from the court on this issue. I want to thank the panelists. It's been a great thank you.